Hi everyone. Today I would like to talk about The Hourglass Throne. It is the third book in the Tarot Sequence series by Katie Edwards. I also want to touch on The Edelon, uh, which is a supplement book to this book. I thought about doing a separate video of The Edelon, but there's just so many spoilers and it's all about the events that happen in this third book, so I decided to just include it all in one video. Like the other videos, I'm just going to talk about the main events that happen in the book at the very beginning of this video, and then later on towards the end, I'm going to re-go over the book and go into much more detail about certain scenes that I want to talk about, and certain theories that I have about, about the series and where it's going in the future. So before I talk about this book, The Hourglass Throne, I do want to mention you should go and read the short stories that Katie Edwards has done. Um, he has a bunch of, uh, he actually has three free short stories that take place in between book two, The Hanged Man, and this book. Uh, the first uh, is the scenes from Quarantine, which uh, goes into detail about the rehabilitation of Sun Estate, uh, about uh, Rune, Bran, uh, Queenie, Max, Adam, Quinn, and the Don Creeks, Creeks all moving out of their different homes and moving into Sun, Sun Estate together. It's a good little story. Not much happens. It's just basically about their move and coming together as a family and a new court. Uh, the second short story is Scenes from the Holidays. These This is a series of short stories dealing with different characters from the series. This is probably my favorite little novella uh, because you get to see different aspects of these different little characters. And probably my favorite of the little stories is The Principality Kieran. Uh, where you get to see a little bit into Kieran's mind. Uh, and he ends up going to Magnus Academy, giving the staff and the administration a piece of his mind on behalf of Anna and Lane. Um, up until this point, I really wasn't too crazy about Kieran, but this story really made me love him, which I'll talk more later on, but I really loved this story. Uh, there's also another one called Date Night or, it's, or the Equinox, something like that. But it's basically Corrine and Adam decide to come up, uh, plan a little date night for everyone. So Rune, Bran, Adam, Corrine, and uh, Diana St. Nicholas decide to go back to the Green Docks to take care of some unfinished business. Uh, some business they should have taken care of at the end of book two, but didn't, so they go back there. And of course they meet back up with Kellum Greenwater. Um, so yeah, that, that's probably my second favorite short story out of that little section. Such a good story. Um, then after that, you have the Battle Kimmy Royale, uh, which is dealing with battle, a battle alchemist tournament that Rune is uh, basically offered to help be a judge on. It doesn't really have much to do with this third book. I think it's just more world building and setting you up for more events that are going to happen in the future. But So I, you don't have to read that third one, but I would definitely recommend reading the scenes from Quarantine and the scenes from Holiday before getting into the Hourglass Throne. Now, it, those little short stories are summarized towards the beginning of the Hourglass Throne, so it's not a necessity. But, I mean, they're free stories and they very are very entertaining. And if you're already reading the book stories, go read the free stories. I mean, they are just absolutely fantastic. So... Now that I've gotten that out of the way, let's get into the Hourglass Throne. So this book starts out in the early morning hours of New Atlantis. Rune has just gotten a call from Lady Priestess, uh, the arcana for the Papist Throne. Uh, apparently there's been some kind of emergency at the Rejuvenation Center. Now there are two Rejuvenation Centers in New Atlantis. There's a secondary location someplace else this emergency is happening at the primary location, which is south of Sun Estate. Uh, so Rune and Bran, early morning hours, hop in the car, head to the Rejuvenation Center. There they meet with Lady Priestess and her one of her daughters, uh, Bethan, Pr Bethan St. Bridget. And she is in a wheelchair, which is very weird. Um, I don't know why any of the healing magics or rejuvenation center can't heal her heal her and why she's in a wheelchair we don't know um but it is a bit odd and rune even makes a comment about how odd it is that her daughter is in a wheelchair uh, but we never really get an answer to that but basically they meet 
with uh, Bethan and uh, Lady Priestess. Um, and basically, they Ruin and Bran learned that a huge dome or shield has appeared over the Rejuvenation Center, preventing anyone from passing through it, in or out. And there's been no signs of life, no signs of any of the staff. They don't know what's going on inside the Rejuvenation Center. Lord Tower ends up showing up. Lady Death is on her way there. Uh, Lord Tower manages to weaken the shield. Uh, just long enough for Rune and Bran to make it into the shield to begin some reconnaissance of the Rejuvenation Center. So while they're going through the Rejuvenation Center, they find that everyone has basically been slaughtered. All the guests, all the staff, everyone is dead. They do find one guy who Rune manages to heal, but he ends up dying later on. But uh, yeah, basically everyone is slaughtered. And from what they can tell, all of this has happened due to a guest that has been staying at the center. Uh, someone they refer to as Subject Jade or Lady Jade. Um, she's called that because she was staying in the Jade Suite at the Rejuvenation Center. Uh, apparently the Rejuvenation treatment had failed. She became very upset, upset, slaughtered everyone. And then she, when she left, she put the dome in place. Fortunately, we don't find out any really any more than that because Lady Death shows up. Lady Death along with Lord Tower end up bringing the shield down so that all the their security forces and everyone can go in to begin investigations. Um, so after this, Rune, Bran, uh, along with Lord Tower, Lady Death, and Lady Priestess have a meeting. They discuss the events at the Rejuvenation Center and basically Lord Tower tells Rune and Bran, look, you're off the investigation. We don't need any more help from you. Rune and Bran are very upset by this, <laughs> which, you know, of course I would be too. But basically Lord Tower and Lady Death say, look, you are in the beginning process of creating your court. You have just moved back to Sun Estate and you have your gala or coronation coming up. You have other things that you need to be focused on right now, not this investigation. Basically, let me handle it. and Let the Arcanum handle it. Well, Rune and Bran aren't very happy, but there's nothing they can do about it. So at this point, story comes, kind of comes to a little bit of a halt, at least in the way of what's happened at the Rejuvenation Center. And we end up going back to Sun Estate. And we end up learning a lot more about how people are getting along. You have a bunch of little events that take place at Sun Estate. I really like this section of the book because we get to see what it's like to build the court how everyone is adjusting to the new home, this new court that's being built. It's it's so good, I really like it. It's a very good step away from the action and just trying to get everything set. Um, and for instance, there's a, a short section in there where Rune chooses his Sinichal, which is basically a court administrator or advisor. Um, I'm not gonna say who that is, <laughs> but I'm very, very happy with his choice as a Sinichal. Um, you also have another short story with pr the Principality Kieran, uh, where we learn a very, very big secret about Kieran. And I actually suspected this secret probably ever since book one, um, but we it was finally confirmed in this book. And of course, I want to talk about this later on at the very end of the video in the spoiler heavy section. So, and then there's also another scene where Vatic Amberson, um, part of the Amberson household, comes to visit Rune, which if that name doesn't sound familiar to you, he was actually mentioned in the second book. The Amberson family used to be a greater house to the Sun Throne. Um, and in fact, the Ambersons actually employed the Dawn Creeks uh, in their magical research division. So and apparently they had lost someone at the Rejuvenation Center thanks to Lady Jade. Um, and while Rune is meeting with Vatic Amberson, there is an assassination attempt at Sun Estate where a revelry member came to basically try to assassinate Rune. Um, at, at every time I've read this series and I've came to this or that read this book and I've come across this scene, I didn't think much of it. But this last time that I read it, I had a little bit of epiphany that I want to talk about. Like there's something very specific. Like I think the author is trying to drop a clue. Um, but yeah, I want to do talk more about this uh, assassination attempt later on. 
Um, so basically this whole section of the book just dealing with the home life of Sun Estate. Um, eventually the gala and the coronation come along. Now uh, the Arcanum, especially Lady Death and Lady Tower, they all want to throw a party for Rune. You know, because I mean the Sun Court is back, they have a new Arcana. They want to party and have a good time. It doesn't happen very often that they get a new Arcana. Um, so Lady Death has offered up her estate for this gala. So Rune and everyone from Sun Estate goes, except for Queenie. She, and I think she stays with Corby, because I don't think Corby's there. But uh, yeah, Queenie refuses to go, which again, I have some theories about later on. So everyone is there. Rune, Bran, and Adam are basically side by side together meeting all the guests. They get to meet with the Arcana. Uh, everyone has brought a bunch of gifts. Uh, Rune even gets a couple of sigils. Uh, it's, it's a very good little coronation gala. Now, this whole section of the book at this coronation event really kind of perplexed me the first one or two times I read it because there is something going on here. If you read the book, you know what I'm talking about, but if this is your first time going through the book, it is so confusing and so frustrating because there is something going on, but you don't exactly know what, and you don't understand why no one else can see what is happening. Like there is some kind of mind control that is going on here. But, you know, I'll, I'll get into that later. Um, but yeah, we have the gala. Coronation goes off pretty well. Rune does have a confrontation with Lady Justice, which I I hate Lady Justice so much. I cannot stand that woman. Um, she does kind of make up for it in the Edelon, but in this book in particular, and just in the other books, I cannot stand this woman at all. And Rune, Rune lays into her at this gala. I love, it's probably one of my favorite little sections out of this book is when he lays into her um but yeah so we had that uh little confrontation with lady justice uh lady jade is there of course um and then uh then we have the events at the man's and i hope i'm pronouncing that right i'm not really sure it's m-a-n-s-e um basically this is a cube like building on the bone hollows estate uh, and basically there are no windows you go in there and it is complete darkness except for the chapel and the showers there's a little bit of light in those two rooms but the rest of it is just in complete darkness uh, the whole experience is meant to deprive you of sight so that you can enhance your other senses uh, do some little reflection um, and basically get to know your friends and family and allies a lot better in complete darkness I think that's a really cool, I think that'd be a really cool experience. And you know, we have some very heartwarming, heartwarming scenes between the different characters, especially when it comes to Lord Tower. Um, because basically, I did not like Lord Tower. I, I haven't since, you know, at least book one, book two, I did not trust him. I believed he was a, sh a wolf in sheep's clothing, basically. You know, I kind of felt the same way about Kieran. Kieran and Lord Tower, I did not like either of them. I believe that they were basically playing along, playing nice, you know, and then eventually going to stab Rune in the back. But uh, especially the scenes from the holidays, I really came around more to Kieran and Lord Tower, and I've really started to like them. And then, of course, this book, especially in the little man's area, I, I really started to like these two characters. And we have a very heartwarming scene with Lord Tower where he gives Rune a gift and also Brand a gift. Um, so, so yeah, it's a very heartwarming scenes. I love them. And then of course, while we're in the man's, Lady Jade makes her move, she attacks. Uh, luckily, everyone does manage to survive. Um, and of course, in the man's, I forgot to say, you have Lord Tower, you have uh, Kieran, Lady Death, um, Lady Priestess is there, Adam, Rune, um, yeah, so you have all the major adults and major allies of the Sun Court there. And they all manage to make it out alive. They survive uh, Lady Jade's attack. When they get out, they find Max and Quinn have been kidnapped and they are now being held as hostages. 
after the events at the man's and the gala, uh, all the arcana and all the companions basically end up retreating to the arcanum bunker to have a meeting to find out who this Lady Jade is and what their next steps are. I, I really like this scene. Anytime the arcanum come together as a whole, I just really like that. I love the bickering and the arguing. I love how Rune just throws a wrench into the whole thing. Secrets are being spilled. I, I really enjoy it. But not much really other than that happens, other than that they decide that, you know, whoever this Lady Jade is, she is possibly hiding in the Warrens. Um, the Warrens are basically an underground cavern or cave system um, where all the failed translocations have ended up. And it turns out there was a lot of failed translocations. And this whole area has become, it reminds me a lot of the back rooms. You have all these like scattered buildings and scattered corridors and cave systems going in and out. I, I really like this area and we actually spend a lot of time there in the Edelon. Um, but that's where they believe this Lady Jade is hiding out. And of course the revelry and I guess Lord Fool also spend a lot of time there. So they haven't heard from Lord Fool. So they basically the Arcanum and everyone decide, look, we need to go check in on Lord Fool. We need to go to his compound and subsequently, you know, go to the Warrens. Um, so basically Rune, Bran, Adam, along with Lady Death, and go to Lord Fool's compound. And of course they find everyone has basically been slaughtered. It looks like some kind of raid has gone on. They, they're they eventually attacked by a man in a serpent's costume. Um, and then they head down into the Warrens. They eventually meet around. The Warrens are basically where all the revelry... revelry, revelry <laughs> I have such a hard time with that word. Basically Lord Fool's people spend a lot of time down there. It's the home of the disenfranchised, uh, the homeless, the drug addicts, gangs. It's a very bad place to be. Um, but they go down there. They eventually meet the alchemist Cornelius. The alchemist Cornelius <laughs> did not realize how difficult those two words are together. Um, <clears throat> and then they, they learn a little secret about him, um, which eventually leads them to the warehouse. Um, I, I'm trying not to go into too much detail to give it away, but basically there is a huge secret about the fall of Sun Estate in this warehouse, um, about this group that had carried out the unsanctioned raid. So <clears throat> after these events in the Warrens, we have finally where the guys, the true battle between Lady Jade begins. Um, Lady Death, Kieran, Lord Tower, take Adam, Rune, and Bran up to the streets, uh, out of the Warrens, and we have the battle for Far Strike Castle. Um, this is where they take on Lady Jade, and of course an Arcana ends up dying during this battle. Um, there's also an event where I I'm trying not to go <laughs> too much, but basically Rune and Adam end up encountering the time stream. Um, and there's a bunch of little secrets that are divulged there. We end up learning about what happened at Sun Estate, and we end up learning about the lies that Rune has been telling. Uh, we also get a meeting with uh, Lord Time. And we also get, have this unknown woman who is speaking to us again, which I thought she spoke to Rune in the sec second book, but after reading it again, it didn't happen. I know he speaks. she speaks to him in the first book, but I don't think the second book she did, but she speaks to him again, which I have some theories later on. So eventually Rune and Adam survive this little event with the time stream and everyone is relocated to the Westlands. Basically everyone on Sun Estate is relocated to the Sun Estate compound in the Westlands. All of the Arcana have relocated to the Westlands, basically to try to get Lady Jade to follow him into the Westlands so they can use what's going on, all the wild magic to their advantage. Um, eventually, you know, they have a meeting with the Arcanum. They talk about how to deal with Lady Jade. Um, and then there's an attack. And of course, a beloved member of the group dies. Um, the author did say that in this book, there's going to be a lot of death. And there was a character that everyone has come to know and love is going to die. 
Um, I did suspect this character might die. It was actually between two different characters, um, which I'm not going to say right now. But yeah, there was two characters I believe were going to die. One of them did end up dying. Um, eventually, Rune takes on Lady Lady Jade, and uh, basically he wins the battle. Um, and then later on, we have the epilogue and the ending story where you have the river, um, which is basically where they have the funeral for the person who has died. And then you have the basic closing up the story. <laughs> so I I'm trying not to go too much detail in this first section of the video because there's so much I want to talk about without giving too much away. But yeah, that, that is the basic events of the Hourglass Throne. Um, it's all about the fight and battle against Lady Jade, whoever she is. Um, you also have the Edelon, which is the supplement book, supplement, yeah, little novella or whatnot to this book. Um, basically, the publisher, from what I understand, had a page limit that the author couldn't go beyond, which makes no sense to me. It, it, that really d makes no sense. So the author had to cut out a lot of stuff a lot of important details and important events so he decided to do a second book that went over all that information which of course you can't really talk about the edelon without going into so many spoilers about this book so uh yeah i won't go to go into really anything with the edelon so uh yeah these are the major events of this book um check out the description below i have a link to where you can buy the book I also have a link to Katie Edwards' website so you can download the free short stories and you can read them and get caught up before you start this book. Now, if you've already read this book uh, and you want to go over to some detailed events with me, then continue watching. All right, now let's go into some more detailed, spoiler heavy areas of this book. So I want to go all the way back to the beginning. We can go through all the story from point A to point B, uh, from beginning to end, basically, and go over the different scenes I want to talk about in more detail. So <clears throat> back to the beginning, we have the Rejuvenation Center, which I really don't, nothing really to talk about there, other than the fact that it's odd that Lady Priestess's daughter is in a wheelchair. Um, I would think they would have some kind of healing magic that could help her and get her out of the wheelchair or at the very least undergoing rejuvenation might heal her um I, I, maybe i'm misunderstanding the rejuvenation process and maybe it doesn't do what i think it does but i just assume besides basically making you younger i would think it would also heal you uh, maybe i'm wrong about that but it just seems odd that with all her resources and all her knowledge that she can't get her daughter out of the wheelchair. And that's just very strange, and I wish they would touch more on that, at least later in the series. Um, other than that, we go back to Sun Estate. And we have a bunch of little short stories uh, detailing the little life, basically, of what it's like at Sun Estate. Um, the first thing is Rune's Seneschal Choice. So I love that he chose Diana St. Nicholas as his Seneschal. Uh, she was very convincing and she made a lot of sense and it just fits together. I love that Rune chose her. Of course, it could create problems with Lady Justice later on. Um, but yeah, for the most part, I'm very, very happy with her choice. I love anytime she's in a scene. Just absolutely fantastic. Uh, then after that, we have the Principality Kieran, where we learn that he is the Lord Magician. So I suspected this all the way back in book one. Because anytime we have Kieran, he's always loosely kind of affiliated with the Hex Throne. And he always seems very interested in anything that may jeopardize the Hex Throne or threaten the Lord Magician. Um, especially when Ashton St. Gabriel managed to get onto the Westlands compound. Uh, Lord Magician's Westland Compound and activate the summoning circle where he activated or summoned Ruick. And, you know, and Kieran was very curious about that. Um, you also have the short story between book one and two, The Sunken Mall, where Lord Magician lost a translocation and uh, Kieran manages to find it. 
And I find it odd that they were all okay with going to this mall. Uh, because if Lord Magician found out you'd stolen from him, that could cause problems. So I found it very odd that they were all okay with this. Of course, you meet the Elementals, who are, you know, basically posing as the Arcanum. And uh, Kieran was very interested in the Hex Elemental. So there's been all these little clues that he is way too invested in the Hex Throne. Um, and then, of course, when you think about it, the tarot deck, well, according to this story, the tarot deck is based off the Arcana. That basically humans saw the Arcana, the Arcanum, they created the tarot deck to reflect that. And so if you look at the Lord Magician, what are magicians known for? They're mo known for illusion and deception. That is the role of a magician is to deceive you, to put on an illusion, you know, watch what hand on the right is doing, not what the hand on the left. So if you think about it, it, it made a lot of sense that whoever this Lord Magician is, he is just a puppet. He is not the real Lord Magician. There could be someone else in the background pulling the strings. And I really suspect that Kieran might be that person. Um, so it's actually kind of nice to actually finally get that confirmation that he is, in fact, the Lord Magician. Um, and it, it's really curious to know how he managed to fool everyone, even including the Arcanum. Because, uh, you know, even Lord Tower doesn't even know, uh, which I find very hilarious because uh, Lord Tower seems to know everything. Um, but yeah, that that's a really cool secret. I'm glad that was confirmed. Um, after that, you have Vatic Amberson, that little asshole who shows up at Sun Estate. Um, and during that little sequence where Rune is talking with Vatic, there's an assassination attempt. Um, a member of the revelry ends up coming to Sun Estate and attempting to kill Rune, or at least we assume it's Rune. <clears throat> now, when I first, the first few times I've read this book, because I've read the Hourglass Stone probably four, maybe five times. Um, every time I've read this, I always assumed this little revelry member, everything that she says is uh, basically some kind of drug induced type thing. She's just a drug addict. She's just talking. Not really much to know what's going on. This last time I read it, I had a little bit of epiphany on what she says. So this revelry member uh, ends up going in Sun Estate and I think it's like Queenie, I think, is in the room along with Corby, Anna, and Corrine. And uh, Rune, Bran, and Adam, you know, they're all outside. I think Adam is there. I'm not 100% sure. But I know Rune and Bran are. And they basically go into the solarium. I think it's a solarium where they're at. But basically this revel mem re revelry member, she ends up saying something about so many glows that they said that there would be one big glow, but there were so many glows and she got confused, basically. I thought this was just absolute nonsense. I thought she's just on the agonies. Um, nothing really important here. But then it occurred to me, you know, she was sent there by Lady Time, you know, who is Lady Jade is actually Lady Time, um, or Cornelius or Vatic, one of those people sent her. And so it makes me wonder, is she capable of seeing auras? You know, can she tell by looking at someone how powerful they are or what potential they have? Um, perhaps Lady Time thought, okay, you know, you will send you to this uh, Sun Estate. You just kill the person who glows the most. And they just assumed that was Rune. Um, but when she gets there, she came a little confused. So maybe Lady Time and everyone else doesn't seem to realize how many powerful players there are at Sun Estate. Because you have Anna, you know, who is a principality. Well, I mean, basically an Arcana herself because she is the heir to the Sun Throne. Uh, you have Quinn, who I don't think is just some simple, basic kind of seer. I really think he is more of an Arcana level type seer. Because um, we do learn in the Edelon that Lord Full is a Quinn. Um, so I really think Quinn is far more powerful than anyone's really given him credit for, even himself. Um, and then you have uh, Max, who I, I, I honestly think Max is an Arcana. Because um, there was something Elena 
saw him saw in him and she really believed he would should be the heir to the lover's throne um you know and we see this kind of with rune where rune was very powerful as a child even as a baby um because there's been a few short stories about that or at least one in particular and then for some reason rune kind of just stopped developing and then started developing later on so i really think something happened when max was little that made elena think he is quite powerful and right now it's just kind of laying in wait laying in dormant and it'll eventually awaken so i think max may actually be quite powerful and we just don't know it yet um, and then of course you have queenie who we learned in the edelon uh is something's going on you know quinn describes her as a black hole um a black hole of some kind and he doesn't understand why he can't see her which is very scary um so i think at, at this point in the book with this assassination attempt i think this revelry member somehow can see potential or see a person's magic or power and, and they just you know and the bad guys just did not realize how many powerful players there were at Sun Estate. And so I think this was just a little clue the author put in there. I'm about to say, hey, there's far more powerful people than what you seem to realize. So moving on, we have the gala and the coronation. This section absolutely frustrated me the first one or two times I read it, because I could not understand why no one could see Lady Time there. You know, I mean, it's very clear she's there, She's using some kind of um, compulsion or some kind of disguise um, to basically shield her from everyone's view. You know, and I can understand that happened to some people, but you have the most powerful people in all in the world there at that location. You have so many arcana and not a single person can see what's going on. Um, I mean, even Rune, who is very good at detecting mental manipulation, you know doesn't quite see what's going on yes he does bite his tongue so on some subconscious level he does recognize what is going on but on a conscious level no and i just could not understand why quinn is the only person there that can see what's going on and that is just so frustrating of course we end up learning you know she's been siphoning magic from people and enhancing her own magic and that's how she was able to overpower overpower everyone but still, it just was a very odd sequence that was going on. Um, and then, of course, after the gala, you know, and Rune gives his little speech, we end up going into the mans. And then Lord Tower gives his little gifts. Now, I talked about early in the video, I did not trust Lord Tower or Kieran. You know, Kieran, I believed, was the Lord Magician. And, of course, magicians are known for illusion and deceit. Or deception basically not deceit more deception so I really believed especially after the second book that Kieran might be a wolf in sheep's clothing and he is a bad guy that's gonna eventually stab her in the back I also believe Lord Tower might be one of those people as well because Lord Tower he is very connected he knows what's going on in the city you know his whole court and everything is centered around information gathering you know, and basically assassinations as well. Um, so I find it very odd that Lord Tower doesn't know who is behind the fall of Sun Estate. Um, <clears throat> so I believed it, it, he had something to do with it. Now, of course, after the little short stories in between book two and three, I started to warm up to him. And especially at the beginning of this book, I started to realize I was wrong. I actually like the Tower. I like Kieran. And I both believe that they are both allies. Um, and of course, we do learn that they are. So, uh, yeah, I wasn't too convinced up to book two. But after that, I gave up on that idea. And I now realize they are allies. And this whole little scene in the man's when they're in the chapel and Lord Tower gives the gifts to Rune. And he gives the hangman's noose to Rune. And then gives a sigil to Bran. That was very, very heartwarming. I think at that point... I really warmed up to Lord Tower. I really enjoyed that scene. And of course, you have the infamous Remus. <laughs> I yeah, I think that's his name. Remus, the little ferret. He finally makes an appearance, which I hope we have more of the ferret in the story. I hope he goes on the road trip with the, everyone in the fourth book. 
that'd be really cool to have a little ferret companion going along. Um, and then, of course, Lady Jade attacks, which she talks about null zones, how it's an oversaturation of magic. And no one seems to understand this. Like, there's even the conversation in, with the Arcanum on how can she new, use null zones. How do they not know this? I, I, don't, I don't get this concept. Because many in the Arcanum are quite old. You know, they're hundreds of years old. There's even several that are probably over a thousand. So how is it none of these Arcana know what an actual nose, null zone is or a null thread? Uh, that That's a bit weird to me. Um, but then again, you do have the siphoning magic that has also been lost as well. So it's possible there's some reason that that information was buried by a previous Arcanum. Um, or maybe the information in null, zone, null zones was only shared with certain individuals. But I just find it weird that Lady Time knows about them. No one else does. Um, and then after that, we learn that Max and Quinn, of course, have been kidnapped by Lady Time, being held hostage in the Warrens. Um, which I want to talk more about that later on in this video, actually, because there's certain little key informations um, that I want to talk about. After this, we go back to the Arcanum Bunker, um, and where everyone, they decide to go check on Lord Fool. Um, and then we learn about the serpent, how Vatic Am Amberson is the serpent, and that Cornelius is the forerunner, or he is the owl for Lady Time. And we learn that these two were two of the men that were assaulted rune during the fall of Sun Estate. Um, so, the scene with Cornelius kind of confused me. I don't know if anyone else who read this, I, I misunderstood what was going on. So Cornelius serves them tea, okay? I assumed the tea was drugged and that's why they all lost consciousness and I couldn't understand why they drank the tea. Even Brand, like I can understand Adam, I can understand Rune, but Brand, why would he drink the tea? That seems like Companion 101, don't drink the tea, especially from someone who is a potential enemy. You don't drink or eat anything that's given to you. And so I really assumed those tea was drugged, but this last time that I read through it, I actually realized it's probably a special ability because Cornelius is a principality. So it's probably some special ability or major uh, that he used to actually knock them unconscious. Um, and then of course they end up killing him, making themselves their way to the warehouse with Lord Tower, Lady Death, and Kieran, where they learn about half house the pack bell and the carriage house uh, listening devices whoever these people are they are very well connected they are very powerful i mean how would you get a listening device into the pack bell without lord tower knowing i mean he that is his specialty you know the fact they were able to get past him and get in there like that 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 is very worrisome you know and it also makes you wonder what they're doing you know, if they wanted Rune dead, they would have just killed him. They, they had plenty of chances. They could have killed him when he was young. Could have killed him during the fall of Sun Estate. But they didn't. For some reason, it seems like they're they're watching him. They're guiding him towards something. I don't know exactly what that is. But it's just very, very weird. And then, of course, we get to talk with the woman a little bit on this Hex Throne communication device. Which... It's very odd that they have it, you know, and Kieran, he knows what the device is because he, of course, is the Lord Magician. It's just how did they get their hands on it? And obviously they have more of them because they're out able to make communication with this other woman. Um, now, I suspect the fake Lord Magician may be um, a part of the group that was known that assisted in the fall of Sun Estate. Um, so my theory is <laughs> that, uh, basically Rune has talked about that there had to have been at least one Arcana involved in order for Sun Estate to fall. Uh, he just doesn't know which one it is. And I've gone through all, all, I thought about all the different Arcana who could have been involved and I've started ruling them out one by one. And I think the fake Lord Magician 
he seems right. Yeah, I think he may have been involved in the fall of Sun Estate. And that maybe explains why this group has these hex thrown communications, um, communication devices. I don't think Kieran is part of it. I think he's very unaware um, because eventually Kieran does come out to everyone. Because right after this, we have the battle for Far Strike, um, where basically Kieran announces his presence to the world that he is the Lord Magician. And of course, we have some different scenes, especially later on with all the arcana, uh, where the fake Lord Magician isn't very happy about being pushed to the side. And he ends up having this little, uh, it tells Rune that basically the Hex Throne is not an ally to the Sun Throne, and that pisses Kieran off. So, yeah, I really think the fake Lord Magician is not, not, not an ally at all. And there's going to be some fighting between Kieran and this other guy. I forget what his name was. Oh, I should have looked that up before I did this. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's my theory on that whole. Then we have the battle at Far Strike, where Adam and Rune get thrown into the time stream. All right. <clears throat> So I took a little break real quick. Um, so now back to the time stream. So Adam and Rune are thrown into the time stream thanks to Lady Time. Um, they're, they are taken to a moment in time, these looping moments or bubbles, um, where we learn Rune's secret. Uh, that basically he is the cause of the Sun Court, um, which I kind of suspected the way he's acting, and I had a feeling what he was saying wasn't true. Um, I just didn't know exactly where he he was lying at. Um, but basically, we learned that Rune was a bit of a shit when he was a little kid. Um, and he's talked about that many times. You know, and he used to sneak out all the time as a teenager <clears throat> um, and not, not take Bran with him. And then Bran would sneak out to try to find him, and then Bran would wander the streets by himself trying to find Rune and he hated getting left behind you know and Rune thought it was funny thought it was a little bit of a game um, and that of course allowed the bad guys to get a hold of Bran who put him under a geos uh, and allowed the bad guys onto Sun Estate so basically this whole thing is Rune's fault um, and we learned that big secret about Rune be, or Bran being under the geos um, and then we end up learning that Rune and Bran were Talas. That, oh, that was such a hard, hard thing to learn in this book. I actually cried a little bit during this piece of information. Because to me, like a Tala is like a soulmate. Uh, I, I know Rune explains that both lovers and enemies can be Talas. But to me, I look more of it as basically a lovers and soulmate type of thing. It's your perfect companion your perfect uh, other. Uh, so the fact that him and Bran were Talas and Bran ended up using the Taliban to break the Geos and save him, that was such a hard thing to learn. I, I was not not expecting that at all. Um, yeah, and then of course Adam learns about it and they can't tell Bran because they're afraid that um, he might be under some kind of compulsion to end himself or he may just end himself, you know, regardless in order to keep Rune safe. I mean, that was such, such a big secret event. And it took me a couple of times reading through to really piece together everything. And it's such a sad thing, too. Um, then you have the meeting with Lord Time. I really wish this was a more verbal uh, meeting with Lord Time rather than a mental exchange. Um, but it was still really good. And then, of course, we have this unknown woman who speaks to Rune again. I wonder if the time stream maybe is a bit alive or has a consciousness. Um, and maybe, you know, it's help trying to help guide Rune. It knows Rune is important. You know, if not now, perhaps later in time. And she's trying to, she or it maybe is trying to help. Um, that or it could just be someone else entirely, but I really think it's something in the beyond, something in the time stream. Um, but yeah, very, very strange. I'd love to hear your theories on who this person is that keeps speaking to Rune. 
because every time it happens is always near death it seems or when he's using the major you know another theory i had is maybe this unknown woman is rune's aspect because anna she has an aspect that can talk to her and she can talk to it like it's some kind of fire dragon at least that's the way it seems in the edelon um because it actually says a name i forget what the name is but it actually has a name so i wonder if Anna's aspect is so powerful and her major basically or her subconscious that she kind of has this dual personality like we think about um, in X-Men you have Jean Grey she has that Phoenix personality this weird subconscious wonder if Anna might have that same thing uh, and I think Rune might have that same thing as well that could be one theory of who this unknown person is <clears throat> but uh yeah it could be the time stream itself, some kind of consciousness. Maybe someone on the outside who knows what's going on is projecting to him. Could be his aspect. I would love to hear your theories on what you think it might be. Um, then after this, we go to the Westland Compounds where we meet with the Arcanum again and talk about the Quadrant's Gambit. Uh, I love it when Rune just basically tells the Arcanum and the Arcana, no, I ain't doing it. <laughs> like, I think it was uh, Lord Hermit or something was like, you know, everyone out, everyone out, all the companions out. And Rune was like, no. And he, he ends up saying something like, do I have a choice in this? And Rune's like, no. <laughs> I just love that how Rune just does what he wants. Oh, uh, and it just irritates the people in the Arcanum. Um, and of course, that's where we had that little scene between the fake Lord Magician and Kieran. Where Kieran basically tells him, you will abide by me. Or basically, you are my voice and my face, but not my will. Um, which, of course, oh, excuse me. We actually had that same phrase or saying done in the first book when Rune and Kieran were in Far Strike Castle searching for Adam. So it's a little bit of piece of the puzzle in the first book that eventually comes around to the third. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Okay, we had the Quadrants Gambit. After that, they're at the Westland Compounds and Vatic Attacks. And uh, we end up learning that Corby and Flynn uh, have a special connection. And in Flynn's actually a familiar. I wish we could learn some more about that. Exactly what it means to be a familiar. And what magic come along with that. Um, I wish we could learn some more about that because we really don't know. And of course, I love how the tower is both, again, shocked. <laughs> when Rune is like, oh, Flynn, that's just uh, Corby's familiar. You know, it's just Lord Tower is shocked time after time about the Sun Estate and everyone involved. Um, and of course, this is where he dies, which was actually very upsetting. Um, and, you know, I actually suspected he might die because the author did say that a beloved character would die in the third book. Um my two that I thought would be the Tower or Kieran. Those were the two people that I suspected might die in this book. I honestly thought it might be Kieran. I really thought he was going to be the one to go. So it was a little bit of a shocker that it was a Tower. But then again, those were the two people I suspected. Um, and that's quite upsetting because I was just starting to like the Tower. Especially at the beginning of this book. Oh, and you have that such heartfelt memory in the man's. Oh, that was so upsetting. And then, of course, Rune goes and has his little quadrants gambit with Lady Time. Um, where, of course, he wins and destroys the carriage house. Which is weird that there was a sigil in the carriage house. I guess not really weird. But it's just weird that Rune didn't know about it, I guess. That, that bent carpenter nail. Um, which really brings about this question of how sigils are made. Lady Time has said that the Bone Hollows used to make sigils and that secret has been lost, which makes no sense because the Lady Dewagger is still around. So how does she not know? And I assume the Lady Dewagger has been in power at least one, 200 years at least. Um, I could be wrong on that, but th that means they must have lost this secret when they were still living in Atlantis, which makes no sense. Um, but I have two theories on how sigils are produced. One is maybe a very traumatic event happens 
Um, and maybe that's how sigils are produced. Because, I mean, Rune went through a very traumatic situation, and Rune is very powerful. So I wonder if a very powerful person goes through a traumatic event, maybe that creates sigils. Um, it's kind of like that Warehouse 13, if you've ever seen that show, on how these uh, special items are made um, kind of thing. But after reading the Edelon, I actually like my second theory best on how sigils are made. So Lady Time has that ruined slab that she actually takes people's life forces and adds it to her own to make her more powerful. I wonder if the sacrificing of people, Atlanteans or maybe magical creatures, create sigils. <clears throat> maybe part of their soul even latches onto these objects. Um, because Quinn has talked about in the past, as like during the first book, that the sigils sing. When he gives the platinum disc to Rune, he says it sings for you. It desires you now. Um, so it really makes me wonder, maybe if you sacrifice one, two, three Atlanteans, maybe that creates a sigil. Uh, maybe sacrificing dozens or maybe even a hundred Atlanteans creates a mass sigil. Maybe creating or sacrificing a thousand Atlanteans creates a planetary sigil. Um, or it could be, you know, maybe a regular Atlantean getting sacrificed creates a regular sigil. Maybe sacrificing an arcana or a principality creates a mass sigil. Maybe sacrificing multiple principalities or arcana will create a planetary sigil. Um, that's honestly, I'm leaning how I think sigils are made. Maybe it's very similar to this siphoning magic that Lady Time has, um, where he siphons people's life forces, sacrifice them, and imbued an object and turn it into a sigil, which could explain why that secret has been lost, that magic, because it was uh, considered very bad. Because you know the Arcanum got rid of the siphoning magic. You know, they did everything in their power to get rid of that. It's possible we had a certain, certain event with the sigils. Um, it's just very odd that no one seems to know. Um, and well, it's possible they do know. Some of the older Arcana may know. They're just keeping it a secret. Um, and we don't know it. But yeah, that's my theory on sigils. Um, so basically we have that Queen's Gambit. Lady Time is dead. Then we have the ending portion of the book. And we have the funeral for the tower, which takes place at the river. Um, where we learned Bran's secret, which really threw me for a loop. I mean, Bran supposedly had romantic feelings for the tower. That just don't make any sense because Bran was whooped by Lord Tower. Um, I, I don't know. If I was in Bran's position, I would not like the tower very well. And considering how he acts around the tower, he doesn't really seem to like him. So it was just a very... That was a very weird secret to handle, and I don't know how to process that. Um, I don't know if it was just a sense of security, you know, and Bran wanted to keep Rune safe, or if he actually genuinely had feelings for Lord Tower. Um, yeah, I don't know what to make of that, to be honest. It really threw me for a loop. Um, and then you have Maya and Rune. Mayan and Rune. They refuse to go in and spill their little secrets in the river. They do not believe the tower is dead. They believe he can be brought back. I'm actually on their team on this. I really am. Because on page 335, when Lord Tower dies, Kieran and Lady Death show up. And uh, basically, Lady Death tells Rune, look, I can sense this kind of stuff. I can tell you someone has died here. The tower is dead. You cannot bring him back. When I read that, I was like, you said someone has died. Yeah, Vatic Amberson died. Rune killed him in that very spot. So she didn't say multiple people have died. She just said someone has died. So I really think perhaps the tower might be alive. Because um, I don't know exactly how Rune or Adam were sent into the time stream. I don't know if they were just sent into the general time stream or if they were sent to a specific moment. I think maybe Lady Time sent him to the specific moment, which would be the fall of Sun Estate. I don't know if Tower was sent somewhere similar or just into the general time stream, but I'm with Rune. 
Um, I think the tower, there's a possibility we can bring the tower back. Um, if not, I would at least like to have a scene where Rune and the tower can speak maybe beyond the grave um, and maybe share some secrets, share some kind of knowledge. I, I really hope it's not the end or the last time we see the tower. I hope he comes back, even if it's just for a short scene where Rune and them can talk from beyond the grave. Um, <clears throat> after this, everyone leaves, and then we have an unknown or an unseen woman who goes to talk to the tower, or goes into the river to spill her secrets. This woman, I'm not sure who she is. I have a couple of theories. One is perhaps she is Rune's mother. Because um, we never exactly learn what happened to Rune's mother. Basically, we are told that Rune's mother died shortly after giving birth to Rune. Which makes no sense because, again, we have magic, we have healing magics. So why was she unable to be healed? Why did she die? We are never told that. Um, so it's quite possible that was some kind of memory manipulation uh, going on to everyone. Uh, the same way that, same thing that Queenie does to everyone. Um it's very possible this woman is Rune's mother. But then again, she does use the phrase, you know, I t you fulfilled your promise of taking care of the boy. Um, something like that. The fact that she says the boy instead of my boy um, makes me really question if this is Rune's mother. It could be someone else entirely. Um, thought maybe it's perhaps the, imp the Empress. Um, but many Arcana have said that if it was the Empress, they would know she's here which means they're keeping track of her or they can somehow sense her. Um, which I don't think exactly is true. It's quite possible it could be this unknown woman could be the Empress or it could be someone else entirely. And to be honest, that's what I think. I think it's someone else entirely. Perhaps it's even that woman who keeps speaking to Rune at his near-death moments. That's quite possible who that could be. Um, but I don't think it's... Rune's mother, just because of the way she phrased the words and said the boy instead of my boy. And the Empress, I don't think it's her because I honestly think Queenie is the Empress. Um, which I, I will get into a little bit later because that is another theory I want to talk about. So after that whole little funeral uh, for the tower, we go back. We have basically have the epilogue or closing story. Uh, Kieran... Lady Death accompany Rune to Leprechaun to move all the stuff out of his apartment into Half House. We end up having a meeting with the Hermit where he says the prophecy about how when the sun rises again on Atlantis, Atlantis will sink beneath the ocean or something like that. Again, can't really make out nothing more <laughs> than that's the prophecy. We don't know nothing more. Um, it's just very curious on what it will cause Atlantis to sink. And I wonder if I, I suspect Rune might be playing a role in that. Maybe his decisions will decide on whether Atlantis will continue or if Atlantis will fall. And I don't know which way would be better. I'm sure we'll find out. Um, perhaps there's a reason that Atlantis should sink below the ocean. Maybe this other group that took down the Sun Court uh, is trying to prevent that. Or maybe they're trying to make it happen. Who knows? And then, of course, he names his throne the Misfit Throne. I prefer the Sun Throne, <laughs> preferably, but I can understand why he chose the Misfit Throne. It is very fitting. Um, then we have the meeting with Lady Justice. Of course, I do not like that woman so much, but she is coming around. Um, and we learn that Christian is the heir to be Lord Justice eventually. So <clears throat> that is basically... All the things in the hourglass throne that I want to talk about. Um, so now let's talk about the Edelon. You know, this follows the events of the hourglass throne with Max, Quinn, and Anna and their kidnapping and their time in the Warrens. So we end up learning about Fiddler Blue, Vatic Amberson, and Cornelius, also known as the Front Runner or Forerunner. Forerunner, Front Runner, something like that. And basically, they are three principalities, which I have to say, there's a hell of a lot of principalities in Atlantis. You know, during the first book, it really made it seem like principalities are quite rare. I'm starting to think it's the exact opposite. I'm actually starting to think principalities are quite common 
and they just remain hidden in the shadows. Because um, here, because you know, the fake Lord Magician is obviously a principality. So if you include him and these others, that's four principalities right there. Um, of course, we end up learning that Fiddler Blue is actually on her our side, basically. Vatic, Amberson, and Cornelius, those assholes are killed. Um, but we learn and uh, we see a little bit more of them with Lady Time and the Warrens. Um, and then we learn about Lord Fool. There is something that I find quite interesting um, about Lord Fool. Um, well, actually, two things, really. First of all, he is a Quinn. He can see he's a seer of possibilities. I wonder if Quinn, maybe at some point, might become Lord Fool. Um because it really seems like that's the way it's going is that the older generations are dying off, the newer generations are stepping up to the plate. So I wonder if eventually Lord Fool will pass away and maybe Quinn might become the new Lord Fool. Um, don't know yet, but that's quite a possibility. But there is something that happens in the Edelon where he seems to be working against Lady Time, even though he makes a vow uh, to not go against her. And basically it's mentioned that if he made a vow to someone else who's stronger, um, then he can basically go around his vow with Lady Time. Um, the question is, who is that someone? Who did he make a vow with that is more powerful than Lady Time? <clears throat> I wonder if it might be Queenie, who he made the vow with, who I suspect might be the Empress. Um, but, you know, there's also something hiding in the Lowlands. Because Quinn does mention during this series that there is something in the lowlands that's even deeper than the warrens that is basically shielding itself or protecting itself from quinn because anytime he tries to use his magic to see what's in there he can't it it stops him um so it makes me wonder if whatever's in the lowlands is actually what lord fool made a vow to or maybe if it was queenie or someone else um i would love to hear your theories on who you think that vow is to I want to know more about what is hiding in the lowlands. We don't learn any more than that. And it seems like probably in the future we will go back there and learn what that is. Um, but yeah, and then we have some good moments between Quinn and Lady Justice in the Edelon. Where it's starting to come around a bit with Lady Justice. Because that during the Hourglass Throne, I could not stand that woman. I was so, I wish she would die. I hate that woman so much. But she is starting to try to make amends, um, starting to try to talk to Quinn more in the Edelon. So I hope, I hope that continues. Um, and then, of course, Quinn loses his magic, you know, thanks to Cornelius and that stupid potion, which I, I really believe Quinn is going to get his magic back. I don't think it's gone forever. Um, probably in the fourth book, The Misfit Throne, he'll probably spend most of it without his powers. But I suspect by book five, six, he'll probably have his magic back. Um, but yeah, that's basically the events in the Edelon. Um, one thing I wanted to talk, there's actually two things that I have notated here that I want to talk about. One is Queenie. So when I first read the first book, I thought Queenie was a little bit of an odd name. I suspected she might be the Empress, um, just kind of based off the name. But as time went on, I started to think, no. Queenie's just, because I mean, I've met people in real life named Queenie. Um, so I figured it was just a name, a little red herring in a way. Um, <clears throat> that, you know, and I believe the Empress is really in North America in exile. Well, after the Edelon, we end up learning that she is quite powerful. Quinn describes her as a black hole, and he doesn't understand why he hasn't been able to truly see her before. Um... So Rich really got me thinking, what if my theory about her being the Empress is correct? And that would make sense about her name. You know, she literally has the name Queen in her name, which is basically the same thing as Empress. Um, I really think the Empress has come back to New Atlantis and she has disguised herself in some way. Um, and she is parading around as Queenie. <clears throat> what her end goal is or what she's trying to accomplish, I don't know. I still don't quite know if she's an ally of Rune or not. You know, I don't think she's an enemy, but I also don't really think she's an ally as well. So I'll get, I hope we learn more later on about that. 
I would love to hear some theories about Queenie from y'all. Um, and it's funny, as I actually went to some forums and someone had actually mentioned this same thing about how they think the Queenie's Empress. And I was like, if I'm not, I'm obviously not the only one who thinks this. So I think there's some real possibility she, she is. Um, the last thing I do want to talk about is after the very end of the book, well, Rune mentions that he can feel Adam after they're brought back from the time stream. And then Bran mentions later on that he can feel Adam. So I, I want to know what is it that developed between them? You know, is this a Taliban that ha has somehow developed between them? Or is this a companion bond or some kind of mixture of both? Um, yeah, because we, we know that Rune and Adam are obviously Talas, but they can somehow sense where they are. Um, so I really think there's a companion bond that is built between them. And I also think there's a companion bond between Adam and Brand, which kind of makes sense because Rune used that companion bond to make it out of the time stream with Adam. So I think it had some kind of a, I, want, I don't want to say negative effects, but it had some unforeseen um, consequences, basically. And so I think they're now all stuck three of them together in this menage a trois type companion bond. Um, I really I really think that's what that is. Um, and another thing that just occurred to me is I want to learn more about this interspeciation of Atlantean society because um, we know Max is part fae. We learned that Cornelius is part reptile. I would like to learn more about these other races. You know, how they exist, where they live, um, why there was some kind of mating between them. Um, I would really like to learn more of that. And we have the werebeasts. Um, I think probably that more side of it would probably come more when we start dealing with more Lord Devil and his court and all the werebeasts. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much all I can think about, all the different things I wanted to talk about. I'm sure there's one or two things I've missed, but uh, yeah, if there's anything you think of, anything you think you found interesting or confusing, let me know in the comments. I would love to talk more about it. Um, I hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you next time.